Today's presentation is entitled Looking for the Bigger Picture, Long-Term Identification and Recruitment Planning and Recruiter Evaluation. In this presentation, we will review some helpful activities and tips recruiters and IDNR supervisors can use to create effective and thorough yearly plans. We will also look at how our yearly plan ties into the metrics we use to gauge recruiter success so both recruiters and IDNR supervisors can be confident in their performance. To begin with, let's talk about why creating a yearly plan is so important. Creating a yearly plan covering all 12 months of the year is an important step for all IDNR efforts. Yearly or annual plans help to set the overall direction of your identification and recruitment efforts, as well as to clarify the goals and important metrics that you will be using during the year. It is important that both individual recruiters and state agencies have complete and thorough yearly plans. Individual recruiters should make sure that their yearly plan ties into and reflects the state yearly IDNR plan. During the course of this presentation, we'll be focusing primarily on the state plan as a whole, but many of the tips that we provide can be used individually by recruiters. You as a recruiter just want to make sure that your plan reflects and ties back into the state's plan, that your goals are in alignment and are similar, and that the work that you do is working towards fulfilling the goals of the state. So what should a yearly IDNR plan include? When we're talking about creating a thorough and complete IDNR plan, all yearly plans should always include, number one, a timeline of the activities and tasks that you hope to accomplish during the year. So we're talking about specifically, what are the things that you will be performing? What is the work that you will do? This can include specific locations you would like to visit, specific farms that you would like to visit, what counties you will be focusing on, as well as specific people that you may need to talk to. It's important that all of these tasks and activities also go back and include any types of um, quality control measures that you have to take, any planning, any training that you do. It should be a complete picture and reflective of your work as a whole. It should include a balanced approach to identification and recruitment. It's crucial that states don't focus solely on one type of identification and recruitment. In order to find as many students as possible and to be thorough out in the field, we have to make sure we have a balanced approach. So we have to ensure that we are going and not just doing in-school recruitment, talking to students and families as they enroll in school, as they arrive, but we also have to make sure that we're going out into our communities, visiting farms, talking to agribusinesses, talking to farm owners, business owners, workers out in the field, as well as visiting housing sites. So we can make sure that we are meeting people in their homes and partnering with community organizations that might be working in the same communities that we are so that we can find as many students as we can. It's important that the yearly plan should also clarify who will be performing what tasks and activities. This is especially true for the state plan as a whole. When you are creating the state plan, it's important to delegate who will be responsible for what activities or what areas of focus as best as possible so that there is clarity and that the recruiters themselves can know exactly what it is that they should be doing. It's also important to include in the state plan any contingency plans that you all might have. We know as recruiters that oftentimes when we're out in the field, things don't always go the way that we plan. There are things that come up, whether that be weather, um, many different types of, of reasons that our plans have to change. And we're looking at a whole, even over the course of the year, there could be re many reasons why our focuses might need to change. And so it's important that we build into our yearly plan those contingency plans, those backup plans, so that just in case something does happen, we're able to pivot quickly and properly address the situation. Similarly, it's important that our yearly plan should have concrete and specific goals that we would like to complete 
because it are these goals that are really going to be driving our work and showing us exactly what we need to be focusing on. As we mentioned, when we're talking about balance, balance is critical for all identification and recruitment plans. You want to ensure that you are performing a wide variety of tasks and visiting a wide variety of locations to have that balance. If you only focus on one type of activity, one type of location, you can miss a whole other population. And so balance helps you to cast that wide net and helps you to find all the students in your area. As mentioned about the different types of locations, different types of IDNR efforts, you know, do not focus only on one location. A thorough plan should include a wide variety, such as, as we mentioned, in-school recruiting, farms and agribusinesses, focusing on both seasonal and temporary work. I find that one of the many, one of the main mistakes I see recruiters making around the country is that they will get comfortable with one type of agriculture, with one type of qualifying work, and that's what they'll focus on throughout the year instead of bringing that balance. For many of the places we work, there's both seasonal and temporary work. And so it's important for us to focus on both types of qualifying activity, finding those processing plants, finding those dairies in our area, as well as focusing on the farms and agribusinesses that have seasonal work as well. You have to make sure that you're spending time to find those community partners that might be working in your community, whether that be Migrant Health Start, migrant health clinics, um, other agencies, refugee resettlement agencies that might be helping to bring new families into your area. There are many different types of community partners that you can be working with that are working to similar populations to migrant students, and they can all help you to build your recruitment network and find new students. Lastly, making sure that you're out visiting those housing sites, as we discussed, going door to door in places where migrant students might live as well as visiting community locations where workers might hang out, such as laundry, such as laundry mats, um, stores, restaurants, where they might frequent. All the work that you do throughout the year will tie back into your yearly plan or should tie back into this yearly plan. The timeline and calendar that you create is gonna help you and help recruiters organize their daily activities and the act individual activities that they perform in their daily work. And everything should build back towards accomplishing those clear goals that you set in that yearly plan. As a reminder, your IDNR plan is never set in stone. Again, a, a common mistake that I often see recruiters make and states make is that after creating a plan, they never go back to review the plan and to address any changes that might need to be made. IDNR plans are flexible. And so you should be able to go back and review your plans every few months to be able to check and make sure that the plan is giving you the results that you desire, helping you truly to focus your efforts and guide what you do. If you find out that it's not accomplishing what you would like to accomplish, you can always go back, review the plan and make changes as often as need be in order to get those desired results. Before beginning your yearly plan though, it is important for you to gather all the data that you will use to create your plan. Remember that all of our IDNR efforts should be data and evidence driven. A lot of times us as recruiters like to follow up and act on instinct. There's things that we believe we know, there's things that we feel, and it's important for us as recruiters you know, to back up the things that we feel and know with evidence and data. So we should collect as much data from as many sources as possible before we begin creating our plan so we can have that data to inspire and to give us ideas for what we should be doing. So when we're talking about what kind of data that needs to be collected, here's some of the things that you can look for. Number one, of course, you want to find the list of students that are enrolled in the program, including addresses. It's important to know where people live because commonly migrant students and workers live in communities, they live around one another. And so if you know where groups of migrant workers and students are, 
There might be others in the area as well. You want COEs that have been completed. Oftentimes it's important to look at data over the last 36 months or so to give you a fuller and complete picture. And so you want to look at you know, the last three years worth of COE data so you can break it down and see exactly how many COEs were produced each month, where these COEs were coming from, what kind of activities were being performed. That way you can know exactly where you should be focusing on. You can identify those locations that had higher number of COEs in certain months and know, okay, this is where we need to be this month. Equally, you can look back at this last few years of COEs and you might notice some trends of certain months decreasing. And so that can highlight and show you areas where you can improve. If a couple, few years ago, you found that you were getting a lot of COEs from one specific county and you were no longer getting a high number of COEs there, maybe that's an area where you might need to focus your efforts on so you can increase those numbers. Similarly, you need to go back through and collect the data so you can see agricultural trends across the state. You can speak to agriculture extension offices as well as looking at the qualifying work done on the COEs to help give you that information. As well as look at any previous goals or benchmarks that you might have had in order to go back and see how well you all were able to accomplish those goals and how effective they were. Some other important data that you need to be collect before creating your IDNR plan. Number one, any list of farms and agribusinesses in the area. List of contractors or important contacts in the area. Recruiting reports from previous years to see how other recruiters, um, what their efforts were and how effective they were. Lists of addresses where families have previously lived, as well as any additional information you believe might be helpful. All states should have lists, farm lists, and lists of agribusinesses in your area. If you do not have farm lists, the IDRC website features H2A worker maps that you can check and visit out to see where farms are in your area, as well as the consolidated farms list. If you are interested in the consolidated farms list for member states, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to share it with you. For more information on the data you can collect, you can visit the IDRC Learning Portal on the IDRC website. From the Learning Portal, you can watch previous webinars on the data that is available to all recruiters, as well as learn how you can use data to improve your IDNR efforts. The Learning Portal is a great site to go back and learn more about identification and recruitment. And as mentioned, as you can see, all webinars that we've produced as IDRC over the last year and a half have been uploaded to YouTube and easy to view. And so you can go find the topic that you're interested in, watch the webinar, and see the links down below that can be helpful resources. For any links that we're discussing during this presentation, Jessica is posting them in the chat box. So feel free to look in chat and explore those links as you see fit. Now let's talk about creating your yearly plan. The first step in making your yearly plan, it is important to know exactly what you have to accomplish during the year and when it needs to be accomplished. So an easy activity to help you see all the tasks that you need to accomplish and that I encourage all states to do is to create a visual calendar of all the IDNR activities that will be performed during the year. So to begin, what you're going to do is when you aim to complete this activity is to take a stack of note cards and you're gonna on each individual note card, write a single activity that is performed during the year as a recruiter. And so if you're working on your state IDNR plan, I encourage you to get a whole group of recruiters, get your IDNR team together and do this as a group instead of doing it solely individually. If you're working as an individual recruiter on your individual IDNR plan, feel free to set aside the time where you can go through and think about everything that you do during the year. Now, as we're talking about this activity, feel free to go ahead and begin practicing. You might not have notebook cards with you, but feel free if you have um, a piece of paper nearby or a notebook or even the notes app on your computer to open it up 
and start begin typing out some of the activities that you do and follow along with the activity. So you can see how it's performed. And so then you can complete it in your own time. The activities that are going to be written on the cards should include specific activities, such as conducting re-interviews and specific crops or agribusinesses that you know are important to your state. As we go through this activity and talk about this project, you will see that each slide has a pile of cards on with an activity written to serve as examples of the type of activities that you can write on the cards yourself. To help make the process easier, I always recommend that recruiters start with the big picture activities for your state and then work your way narrowing down to more specific activities. So for example, you can start by as a state level, one of the activities could be something such as creating a state training plan for IDNR. And then from there, you can break that down into specific trainings that you would like to see happen or specific conferences that you would like to see staff participate in. You know, be sure not to forget those kind of activities such as training, planning, regular updating of planning, creating resource guides, conducting research in our areas, updating farm lists as maps and making partnerships in your community. There's a lot of work that recruiters as a whole take for granted and I think forget about during the course of our efforts. We think about our work as recruiters and the work in identification and recruitment, and we focus solely on the visiting of farms, the visiting of families in their homes, following up on surveys in schools. And we forget about a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes to make all that happen. And so be sure to not forget about that, to look at the big picture and all of your efforts as a whole, because they're all important to help guaranteeing your success. And so now take a minute and think about what some of the activities you might write down are. As I mentioned, if you have a piece of paper next to you, go ahead and start writing some down. Open up the notepad app in your computer and write some down as well. What are some of the crucial activities that you would write down that you want to do during the year during the year let us know by typing it into chat and i'll give you a minute to think about it We're seeing a lot of good answers in chat. We can see creating a contractor list with important contacts, checking in with families to get residency verification data, and checking in to see if they left and returned during the summer. Different crop seasons, such as soil preparation, planting, scheduling meetings, working with Migrant Head Start, following up on missed enrollments, spring reports, looking at spring reports from past IDNR, printing out reports and sharing them with team members. So we're seeing a lot of great answers and a lot of great responses. We can see contacting contractors for H2A workers. And so you all have a lot of great ideas. And I think it goes to show the wide variety of things that we do and why creating our yearly plan is so important because recruiters do so much and it's easy to overlook or miss certain details of the job. And so it's important that we work to have a complete thorough plan so nothing is missed and so that we can make sure that we're getting out there and doing all that we can accomplish. So in doing this activity, 
you know, as a state, if you're working as a group, I recommend to take an hour, hour and a half to go through, write things down, brainstorm with one another to make sure that nothing is being missed. But if you're working individually, you can dedicate about 20 to 30 minutes to writing down the different activities that you perform. As you can see from just getting a minute, the chat box was filled with people providing great answers. And so we all you know, can brainstorm and things will come quickly. But you wanna make sure that you're giving yourself that time you know, to be as thorough as possible and think of everything that you do. You know, if possible, work with a partner to help brainstorm and bounce ideas off of. You know, your partner might remember something that you forget. And then after you're right, finished writing all your activities down, lay out the cards in front of you and review everything there so that you can ensure that there's nothing missing. You want to go back and look at them as a whole just to see that, that there's nothing glaring that that you're missing so after you've had the cards laid out and you've reviewed the cards you're going to create a calendar and so you're going to want to create 12 different columns one column for each of the months you can even create take a notebook card and maybe write in a different color the names of the months the setup as the headers for the columns and then what you're going to do is you're going to go through your pile of cards and you're going to start sorting them into the different columns for the months of the year. So you're going to start sorting them according to when the activity needs to be done. It's important to note that a lot of the activities we do might take place over the course of several months, as well as, um, you know, so we might need to make multiples of some cards so we can properly put them in, in the months that they're being completed. And so you may have multiple of the same cards, so you can put them in multiple months, and that's okay. Your 12-month calendar is essentially what's going to lay that foundation for your yearly plan. Once you have all the cards laid out over the course of the 12 months, you can build and expand upon this calendar as you see fit. It's important to do this activity because visualizing all of our work also allows you to notice the months where you're going to be very busy and the months that might be slower. The months with the most amount of cards in them are going to be those peak months. And so those are the months where you know that you need to plan properly and be at your best and be the most organized so you can make sure that there's nothing that you're missing. Similarly, you're going to notice and you're going to find months that have least amount of cards and these are going to be your slow seasons and the months where you're going to need extra planning where you know that these are the opportunities that you can use to maybe experiment try new activities that you would have missed otherwise that you can do new things explore new areas and so pay attention to those peak and slow seasons because they're going to influence what you do in the work and your planning. Remember that timing of identification and recruitment efforts is critical. Identification and recruitment can move very quick. It is important that we are performing the appropriate activities during the appropriate times. Oftentimes, you know, if we are a week or two late, we can miss new students. And so creating a detailed calendar can help us to ensure that we're being as effective as possible, as well as performing the activities in the right time. You don't want to be missing people because you're visiting farms during the wrong time of the year or because you know, you're out visiting housing sites after people have already left. You want to make sure that activities are being performed at the time where you can be most effective. Similarly, for example, right now, start of September, start of the new performance period, and so many states are currently preparing for their re-enrollments, their re-verification, collecting that data, going out, checking to see if families, you know, that maybe arrived during the summer, that they're still here. And it's so important for families to be, contact, be contacted for re-enrollments at the beginning of the performance period to verify that the data that you collect is correct, and it allows you to speak to the family and obtain any potential leads in a timely manner, especially if families you know, arrive during the summer and then leave, you want to make sure you speak to them before they leave so you can get any information they may have about any potential families.
while reviewing your cards as well, you're going to want to look for any patterns or groups that you can divide cards into. Look for cards with similar activities, but you don't have to get too specific with your groupings or pairings of the cards. So for example, as before, we had cards on the screen that were showing examples of potential activities that you could perform. Now, as we go through this part of the activity, each card is gonna have an example of a potential grouping. So we can see here, one group you might find of the card is local housing activities. This can include everything from visiting H2A farm worker housing to visiting specific trailer parks, meeting and speaking to organizations that help with housing in your area, visiting certain apartment complexes where you know migrant students might be living, all of those can be wrapped up under the grouping of local housing activities. As you go through and sort through the cards, you're going to find lots of different patterns. And so take the time to properly think through what the logical patterns are that you're seeing and to help kind of prioritize. Some cards might go into multiple categories, multiple groups. And so work through that process and thinking about which group would be best. Generally, it's best to place you know, one card in one group and not have multiples of the same card in multiple groups. And so think through it. Again, work with a partner if you can to help work through some of these difficulties that you may have. And then write down as you sort through the groups, you know, come up with a name that you can give to the group and write down the name of that group on a separate note card. You're going to want to save the cards with the group names. And you can use these group names in the future to help identify your goals and the performance metrics for the year. Some other examples of group names that you might come up with includes worker housing visits, quality control activities that must be done, community agencies, business advertising, data collection, planning and reporting or training, you know, chicken processing plants that must be visited or cabbage farms that must be visited. Once you have all of your activities sorted into groups, you can then take your information and convert it into a spreadsheet to help you organize your thoughts. And so for ease of use, as mentioned, you can transfer your calendar into spreadsheet or on Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. What you can do is along the top of the screen, you can list the months of the year. And these are gonna be the columns as we saw earlier. And then on the left-hand side of the screen, you can break it down into the different groups of activities. And so you're gonna have those group names of activities in the first row and the months along the top columns. You can then begin writing the activities in each group under the column of the month where the activity will be performed. So for example, in this example spreadsheet, you can see the very first grouping of activities is IDNR team training. So you can then go through and begin placing what trainings would be performed during each month as you had fit. You can see the second grouping is MEP team activities. So these can be team building activities or activities where the entire migrant education program participates, such as you know, the statewide re-enrollment efforts or any other kinds of team building activities that you might have. You can see the quality control grouping that includes things such as re-interviews, reviewing you know, training manuals, reviewing procedures, and so forth. And so you're gonna wanna go through and break it down and write all the activities. You can also create under each month a second column. And so you can use the second column to assign exactly who will be in charge of the activity or to indicate the priority of the activity. And so you can assign responsibility to certain recruiters, certain parts of the state, certain groups of recruiters, or you can list whether an activity is considered to be high, medium, or low priority.
as you go through working, creating your spreadsheet and your calendar to help see everything, you're going to want to add each group to the spreadsheet one at a time to help make organization easier. That way you're not having to go back and inserting rows in the previous areas. You may also need to merge some of the cells to make the spreadsheets easier to read. If you're not that familiar with using Microsoft Excel or spreadsheets, there are great trainings listed on the IDRC learning portal. That's all about using graffiti efforts. Um, that's all about using um, spreadsheets in for recruitment efforts. And so go out, watch those trainings to help learn a little bit more about how to use spreadsheets. Once you have completed, once you've completed writing out all the different groupings of activities and having all the individual activities listed, you will have a complete and organized calendar in your spreadsheet of everything you want to accomplish during the year, ready to print off and share with others that you can use. It's a great way of being able to visually see the information in a way that's quick and easy and it's easily shared. So once you have your calendar complete, it's time to begin setting some goals. So you're gonna to wanna to take the cards that you created and you're gonna use these to help decide your goals. Review specifically the cards with the group pairings, the group's names, so those group of activities. And you're gonna to wanna to choose the five to six groups that you want to focus on during the year. You're gonna to wanna to choose the groups that are gonna be the most impactful for recruiting and for your team. And you're gonna base your goals around these group of activities. You don't wanna to choose too many activities because having too many goals can oftentimes lead to confusion as well as be overwhelming for recruiters. And so focus on those five or six that you feel are most important and that's where you're gonna begin. As you go through, you're going to want to choose your goals in such a way that you are emphasizing and encouraging that well-balanced recruitment efforts. As we mentioned before, we want to make sure that everything we do is around being as thorough as possible and visiting a wide range of activities. And so make sure your goals reflect that. Choose goals as well that are varied and encourage recruiters to explore their communities and visit new locations to recruit in both seasonal and temporary work and visit the wide variety of locations in their communities. So for example, some pairings that you might choose, some groups that you might choose to focus on for your goals could include, you know, the agribusiness group, which is visiting farms or processing plants in your area. Community partners groups, which is, you know, working with those organizations. Maybe you struggle with making you know those connections and so you choose that as a goal that you want to work on this year housing visits professional development quality control recruitment sweeps and in school recruitment when you're creating your yearly goals you want to make sure that your goals give recruiters targets to aim for and you know help recruiters organize their thoughts so you want to make sure that your goals are following the SMART goals guidelines. SMART, for those that might not be familiar with it, means goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So you want to want to make sure that your goals, you know, being specific, are direct and clear, that they're measurable, so there's a clear way that it's quantifiable and able to be tracked, that it's attainable, that it's realistic, and actually something that you can accomplish or that you have the tools and resources available to accomplish. You want to make sure that it's relevant, that the goal follows along with what you're doing, aligns with your mission statement and other goals for the program, and that it's time-based or time-bound, meaning that you want to make sure that there's a limit set for when this goal needs to be accomplished. So now as we look, let's, what are some possible examples, you know, that are following these SMART guidelines for some of the groups that we looked at? You know, for agribusinesses, maybe you can set that your goal 
that your staff will visit 30 agribusinesses per month. Earlier in chat, Jessica mentioned exactly this. You know, if you are out, one of your goals is for farm visits, you can set that the goal for each recruiter is to visit at least 25 farms per month. If your goals focus on community partnerships, maybe your goal could be that recruiters will attend at least four meetings a month with at least four different community partners. That way you're encouraging your recruiters to get out there, to build up those relationships, to establish those meetings and build up that trust. If you're, one of your goals is on housing visits, you know maybe you can set the goal that staff will visit three quarters of all H-2A housing sites in your state within 30 days of the H-2A workers arriving. Again, so you're creating that time bound limit. You want this to be done within 30 days of when they arrive so that recruiters will know exactly what they have to do and have something to aim for. You know, and if you have, you know, you choose to focus on professional development as a goal, maybe your goal can be staff will receive at least one identification and recruitment training every quarter. Some other examples of yearly goals, you know, if you wanna focus on quality control, Maybe your goal is that you'll complete 50 re-interviews by July 1st that will return an error rate of 2% or less. And so again, we see here a goal that's specific, that has data attached to it with a specific time that you're looking to accomplish. If your goal is to focus on recruitment sweeps, you know, maybe your goal is that staff will complete two recruitment sweeps in the state during the course of the performance period. And if your goal is to focus on that in-school recruitment efforts, maybe the goal is that recruiters will follow up for all referrals submitted by school districts within two weeks of receiving the referrals. So again, we have a time limit that you're hoping to accomplish that the referral will be contacted within that two week period. And that's something that you can measure and follow up with. To learn more specifically about setting SMART goals, you can go to the IDRC learning portal or to the IDRC YouTube page to watch our previous webinar from earlier in the year, hitting the target, creating a daily plan and SMART goals. From there, the webinar goes into more details about what SMART goals means, how to create your SMART goals and how that impacts identification of recruitment efforts. We'll also be posting all webinars that we do on our YouTube channel as well as new training videos. And so subscribe to the YouTube channel today to see for free all the webinars that have been previously released by IDRC, as well as to see you know, all webinars that are recorded future, as well as all future training videos. So now let's talk about measuring recruiter performance. It can often be difficult to gauge recruiter performance. And I know for recruiters as well, it can be very hard to gauge how we're doing. Being a recruiter can sometimes be an isolating job. We work alone out in the fields. We sometimes don't see many of our coworkers. Maybe we might not speak to our supervisors every day. And so because of that, it can be difficult for us to know how we're doing. A lot of times for us as recruiters, our only data point that we really focus on and our instinct is to gauge our performance only on the numbers of COEs that we collected or the number of students that we have enrolled in the program. However, it's important to note that the number of COEs collected, the number of students enrolled is only you know, a byproduct, is only the end result of many of the other efforts that we do. And so it's a lot of the other hard work that lays the foundation for recruitment that ends up and leads to these COEs. But it's not the COEs themselves that we should be tracking or we should be focusing on because it doesn't give a full and complete picture of the work that we do. And so if we're looking to gauge recruiter performance, it's really important that we look at that at performance as a whole. Oftentimes, I've seen it that if we only gauge recruiter report performance based on COEs or student enrolled, it can be detrimental to recruiters and how they view themselves, as well as recruiter mental health. If recruiters only focus on COEs or student enrollment, 
they can oftentimes get burned out during those slower times or when recruiting becomes more difficult. It's something that I've heard over and over and over again when we're talking to recruiters is that, you know, when they struggle to find new students, when they struggle to complete those COEs, they'll often want to work harder. They'll push themselves to do more, working longer hours, pushing their limits, and it can get them exhausted. It can burn them out mentally. They start having a negative view of themselves. When the reality is that, you know, there are many factors that can go into and influence you know, whether or not you're able to get a CUE, whether students are moving into your area. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that are beyond recruiter control. We as recruiters, all we can do is work hard and do our best, you know, and so you have to make sure that when measuring recruiter performance, that you are doing so in such a way to measure the complete totality of the work that recruiters can do to take everything into account. You know, recruiting is as much is as much about collecting and following up on information and building relationships within the community as it is about enrolling new students. You know, I had one recruit, recruiting supervisor tell me one time, they know how good of a job a recruiter does when they go out into the field with that recruiter and they see how many people in the community already know the recruiter's name, because that shows that they've been out building those relationships whether or not they were able to get COEs or find new students, it shows that they've been out in the community building those relationships and that they're well known. The data and information that collected by recruiters is one of those key ways that we can measure recruiter performance. It's important for ID and our supervisors to regularly review recruiter reports to evaluate the data the recruiter is collecting and to ensure that information is being followed up on in a timely fashion. I think oftentimes, even as IDNR supervisors, they can be overwhelmed by the amount of data that's getting collected, um, by the amount of um, reports that are being turned in, and they can get a backlog. And so I've seen many times before where those supervisors can get overwhelmed, so they don't go through the reports as often as they should, they don't review them, and that can just lead as well to recruiters not feeling the support that they need. And so it's important for supervisors to put priority in reading those reports, collecting those reports. It's important for recruiters to put priority in filling out those reports as well, because they really help. It's a two-way relationship, you know, filling out that information, showing the information that recruiters have collected in the field goes a long way to showing the work that they do as well as going a long way to allowing supervisors to properly evaluate your efforts and provide feedback when needed and to provide support that recruiters often need. In addition to reviewing those recruiting reports to assess the data that recruiters are collecting, states also need to establish performance targets and benchmarks to measure recruiting performance. When they're creating these benchmarks, you, they should reflect the totality of the work that recruiters do while bo working both in the field as well as working from home, as we've mentioned. As well as these benchmarks and the ways that we measure performance should also tie in to the goals that we have set for our yearly plan. Everything should work together. So just to give some examples of what some helpful benchmarks might be, if you're wanting to measure recruiter performance, look and maybe start tracking how many conversations recruiters have had in a week. How many interviews have they had while out in the communities? How many people have they spoken to? How much time have they actually spent in conversation with farmers or farm workers? How many different housing sites have they visited? How many doors have they knocked on? How many people have they talked to? How many community partners have been contacted during the week? All of these things kind of help to show, you know, the fundamental and crucial work that leads to COEs and leads to student enrollment, but you're not directly measuring those COEs. You're measuring that foundational work that recruiters do. Like with your goals, you want to make sure that your performance benchmarks are specific, measurable, and time-bound. You want to make sure that they're clear and easy to understand so that recruiters know exactly what they're looking for 
in exactly what they should be doing. You know, you want recruiters to know how you are going to be measuring their job performance. And we want recruiters to be able to know how they should measure and view their own performance as well. And so it's important that these benchmarks that you create by looking at your goals that you've set, by looking at the activities that you've set, are as clear as possible. And so as you're working through this process, you're going to want to make sure that you create sufficient reporting to collect that data that you need for your benchmarks. It's important that at this point, you may have to get creative for how you'll collect the data. You know, start first thinking about those benchmarks, thinking about what kind of information you could collect to really see how your recruiters are doing. And after you've figured out what those benchmarks are that you would like to collect, you can then go from there and start thinking about what kind of data you can collect to support those benchmarks. For us at IDRC, for the last year, we've been using a new tool called Connect Team to help collect data. Um, I wanna highlight Jose in the chat mentioned, you know, that one data point that you can use, for example, is by looking at how much time passed from students qualifying arrival date to the date the COB was completed to kind of show, you know, how long it took for that family to be in the community. You know, that can oftentimes be a good indicator, you know, of how well a recruiter is getting out there. Of course, there's always going to be times where for one reason or another, you know, families might be missed or it might take a little bit longer to find a family. But, you know, it kind of goes to show how we can get creative in finding that data point. Look and see how different data points connect or what the relationship they have with one another and use that to help establish your benchmarks. As we mentioned, IDRC has been using for the past year Connect Team to collect data. We had a pilot where families were, um, where students were out there visiting different new locations using Connect Team to report back. You know, Connect Team is a great and very flexible pattern a platform that can really help you to create the reports that you need and build those data collection tools to properly evaluate recruiters in your state. Over the next year, as IDRC moves into year two, we're really excited about continuing to use Connect Team to continue to explore the ways that Connect Team helps us to collect data. And so we're excited to share some of the new things coming up with Connect Team. You know, it's available right now to all member states through the subscription that IDRC has. And if you would like to learn more, you can view, you know, the Connect Team portal or the Connect Team page on IDRC's learning portal to view the previous webinars produced about using Connect Team. Another point that Jose made in chat that I would like to point out is as you're going through data, collecting these data points, it's important when you're looking for these benchmarks to look, you know, use this data that you've collected to be able to look for trends and patterns in what you're doing. And so you can use the data collected to help show the story of recruitment efforts. And so you're gonna to wanna to look for those patterns that let you know exactly what's happening. And so for example, it's not just about, you know, finding those one or two QADs where COEs where there's been a long time between the QAD and when the COE is completed, you're going to want to look for that pattern to see if it's a regular thing where recruiters are regularly finding families late, because that might indicate a problem or an issue. As well, we had a question in chat asking about if this training will be available to go over again. This training will be uploaded later today to the IDRC website, as well as to the YouTube page. And so feel free, you can subscribe to the YouTube page to get it quickly or you can check the IDRC page later in order to rewatch the webinar. And now to talk a little bit more about some of the things that IDRC that we have coming up and that we're really excited about. To begin with, I want to announce, you know, we've mentioned it at our monthly newsletter, but IDRC has created a new Facebook page that everyone can follow. We've created a Facebook page because we often get asked from states, about how to use social media tools in recruitment efforts. And so we wanted to create a page where we can show examples of what states can do to use social media effectively, as well as a page where we can share information quickly and easily with, our, with member states, with non-member states to let you know 
the work that IDRC is doing and what some of our new tools are. You know, every month that we send out our monthly newsletter to announce the great things that we're working on. But if you don't want to wait to the beginning of the month to hear about the new projects that we're doing, IDRC is going to be unveiling throughout the month new tools and resources on their Facebook page before they're announced in the newsletter. So, for example, in the newsletter that just sent out, Jessica mentioned all the great new language learning resources that have been posted on the website. But we announced those on the Facebook page, as well as links to those resources last week. And so you can be ahead of the game seeing the new things that we're being that we're publishing. All you have to go to is facebook.com slash identification recruitment to like the page and to see you know what we're up to. We also regularly post on there links to new articles that discuss agricultural trends around the country about issues that impact migrant workers. And so it's a great place as well to stay educated about what's happening you know, in the lives of migrant families and in agriculture around the country as well. I'll be posting the link once we upload the video for today's webinar to YouTube and to the IDRC website. I'll immediately post that link to, face, to the Facebook page. So if you're looking to find that the webinar later on, you'll have access to it that way. Similarly, we're like we're glad to announce that our recruiting 101 module is is now sorry it's not not available it's now available on the IDRC website. One of the big things is we were working through year one of IDRC that we heard from many states is the need for better training for new recruiters. So many states were bringing on new staff. And we're struggling with how they can help make sure that new recruiters are prepared for the field. And so we worked with member states to create a whole module that's all about getting recruiters prepared for entering the field. So Recruiting 101 is a series of seven different lessons that are designed to help equip new recruiters with what they need to be successful. The seven lessons to go through everything about what makes a recruiter great, to the different resources that are available to recruiters, to talking about eligibility, such as what is a migratory agricultural worker, what is a qualifying move, to looking at what the COE is, what recruiters should know about their first day out in the field, and what recruiters need to do after returning from the field to help plant those seeds of future success. The Recruiting 101 module, all the lessons, you know, have a PowerPoint that recruiters can work through themselves with a workbook that includes links to new resources that they can go to continue learning, as well as activities and mini quizzes for each lesson so that they can gauge how they're doing in their learning process. And each lesson includes a recorded video that they can watch as well. And so they can go to the YouTube link to view the YouTube video to see and hear the lesson themselves. And so we encourage you know, both new and experienced recruiters to use this new resource, you know, to, to learn as well as to kind of refresh themselves on what they need to know to get out into the field. As well as, Jessica, can you post the link in chat to our new language resources as well so that we can show them off too? We're also proud to announce that we have new English language resources available on the IDRC website. It's idr-consortium.net slash language resources. And so this is a new tool that we've created to easily share with students when we're out there. Many recruiters, when they're out working in the field, often do these initial services. And so we wanted a page where you can share quickly and easily with your students many of the workbooks that we have and that are available for free for them to use. And so you can go to the language learning resource page. You can go find the books that are available. There's PDF copies of each book available as well as downloadable audio files. But the new thing that we've created that Jessica has worked hard on is creating online versions of the books as well. And so just as um, you would go and scroll through a book, any person that you share the link with directly can go through and read through the books 
as if they were on their phone. And so they can scroll through page by page. There's no need to download anything. It's just right there on your phone, right there on your computer for them to be able to work through, as well as to have that audio file ready to go. And so it's a great way to help students um, to make learning easier, as well as as recruiters to help making sharing resources with our students easier as well. And so I encourage everybody to go out, explore the language resource page, explore what it is you know, that we have to offer and share it with your students, share it with those in your community as it's free for anybody to use. Many of the language books as well include multiple levels. And so you can share, you know, you no longer need to wait, you know, to when you can go back to visit, um, you can go back to visit a new student to drop off, you know, a more advanced level of English. You can quickly and easily share via text message, WhatsApp, the link to the next book, and then they can start using it there on their phone. And so that concludes our presentation today. I'm looking at the bigger picture on you know, how to create a yearly plan and measure recruiter performance. We ask as part of our federal requirements um, for everybody to complete a survey review form. And so you can go to the SurveyMonkey link that's been posted in chat, or if you've never used one before, you can take out your phone and use the camera to scan the QR code here. And that'll open the link direct to the survey training review form on your phone as well. It's just a quick brief survey to let us know how we're doing. We wanna make sure that we're providing quality training for everyone out there, as well as if you have any ideas on what kind of trainings you would like to see in the future. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and be on the lookout on our Facebook page and on the IDRC website for the recording of the webinar going up later today.